don't know what is. So whether you are a fan of Michael's wines already or you're here this evening to learn a little bit more about them, I do hope that you will all join me in raising a glass and welcoming Michael this evening. So welcome. Good evening, Michael. Hello, uh, very good evening uh, from Austria. Uh, welcome to everybody at Wine Society. I'm very happy that you're all here. And uh, I, I would like to uh, introduce you tonight uh, a little bit on, on the history or to the history, and the significance, the, the culture of Schloss Wilbersberg. And uh, uh, in the next 20 to 30 minutes, I, I would like to give you a, a brief overview actually uh, on, uh, on everything that is connected to, to the estate. But before that, I would like to say a few sentences on, on Austria in general uh, as a kind of an introduction, you know, to get into Austrian wine, the culture and significance of Austrian wine in general. And uh, I have prepared a few pictures uh, in order, you know, to, sh to show you a, a few maps and pictures on, on Austria and the area. And uh, let me see if we can share that with you. So here we go. And uh, uh, Goldsberg is, uh, as already Anna mentioned, one of the oldest estates of Austria. And its history is very much connected to the overall history of Austrian wine in general. Now, Austrian wine starts basically during Celtic times, so already significantly before Christ. And, but there are two major developments who were marking the developments of Austrian vineyards. First of all, the Roman Empire. During the time of the Romans, uh, it, a, a big uh, development and impact uh, of what we have today was done. And uh, you can say that uh, there's definitely, you know, a, 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 a huge mark, you know, that the Romans set in the, in the overall structures of Austrian vineyards until today. But the second development were the times between the Middle Ages to the time of secularization, so the time of the French Revolution at the end of the 18th century. And during this period, monks and monasteries were the ones who were developing Austrian wine culture to a high extent. Uh, there's a very simple reason behind, uh, because during this period, monks were some of the only ones who could read and write. Therefore, they were the carriers of scientific research. So monks were trying to find out new grape varieties. They were trying to find out the best places to grow wine in Austria. And uh, they were the ones who made big improvements also in the winemaking. Now, as in France and in Germany, due to the outcomes of the French Revolution, uh, all the monasteries were privatized or you know, uh, taken over by the governments. In Austria, we had a different history to these developments. And this is the reason why we still maintain a rich culture of monasteries and monkish life in, in, in Austria. Now, uh, Austrian wine today, uh, so, so for everyone who's really interested or want to go deeper into the history of wine, uh, I, can, uh, I can recommend a, a book that was just recently published, uh, Wine in Austria, the History. Uh, it's also a book uh, where uh, I donated two chapters in, in, in this book. Uh, I really highly can recommend it. Uh, you can order it via the page of Austrian Wine or via Amazon. Uh, it's a fantastic publication for everything that is connected to, to the history of Austrian wine in the past 2000 years. Now, Austrian wine today is a family business. So the, the biggest part of Austrian wineries are family uh, businesses. And we have a, a, a rich history and, and you know, long traditions in, in Austrian wine. However, you know, we have also modern attitudes. We're trying out new things. Uh, we are trying out new trends. Uh, so Austrian winemakers also have, you know, new approaches and, and are very accurate in, in, in what they're doing. Now, looking to the structures of Austrian wine, it's, it's quite easy to understand. As you know, we are on the continental side. 
uh, the biggest part of Austria is covered by the Alps. This is why Austrian wine is basically here in the eastern part of Austria. And we're differentiating between three major regions of Austrian wine. So you have the most southern parts, an area that is called Steiermark or Styria, uh, where producers are concentrating on Chardonnay and on Sauvignon Blanc. Then the Danube is passing here through Austria, coming from Germany, departing via Slovakia to Hungary. And you can see that everything that is south here of the Danube is mainly red wine production, whereas everything along the Danube and north of the Danube is mainly white wine production based on Grunewaldina and Riesling. Now, as two thirds uh, of, uh, of Austrian wine production is basically here in the north, Austria is mainly known as a white wine producing country on the international side. Now, Goldsburg is located here in the, in the Danube region. So uh, this is an area that uh, is about uh, an hour west of uh, Vienna, the capital city of Austria. And the Danube region is a valley landscape. Uh, you know, Austria in total has about 45,000 hectares of wine. Uh, and the Danube region is looking after about 10,000 hectares of wine which is about the size of today's Cote d'Or, so the, 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 the heart piece or the, 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 the heart of, of, of Burgundy uh, production. Now, uh, the, these valleys, uh, I have a few pictures. Uh, so this is a, a picture of uh, the Kremstal appellation, uh, the Trisenthal appellation, uh, the Wachau uh, Valley appellation, the Wagram, uh, the Kamtal appellation where Goldsburg is also at home. And when you're coming to this area, you will identify two general types of vineyard sites. You can see on one side, you can see the terraces along the valley of the Danube Valley and the side valleys of the Danube. And these vineyards are very dry. They have a high mineralization in the soil. So this is ideal for, for Riesling productions. On the other side, you find vineyards that are based on loess, on clay, so vineyards that have a good water supply to the wines, which is ideal for Gruner Veltliner. Now, the grape varieties of Riesling and Gruner Veltliner are complementary. So what one likes, the other doesn't like, and the other way around. And this is the reason why we have the two grape varieties, because we have those two opposing structures in our vineyards. Now, when it comes to wines of origin, we have an appellation system that is easy to understand uh, and uh, something that you, you uh, will understand easily. We are differentiating between three categories of wine. So there are the, the regional wines, the village wines, and the wines of the single vineyards. In Austria, we call them Ried, so like, the, uh, like Riedel without the L. And read is the historical indication for a single vineyard. So that makes it easy for you to identify a single vineyard name on, on an Austrian label, because it's always, uh, always identified with the term of read. So it's read Lamm, read Heiligenstein, read Leuserberg, read Käferberg. So this is an indicator that makes it easy for you to understand uh, that a single vineyard is indicated on an Austrian label. Besides the appellation system, uh, we started already more than 25 years ago uh, to work on a vineyard classification system. Uh, you know, one of the big challenges of appellation systems is that the smaller the origin, the more names uh, you are confronted with, with the result that uh, in Austria, we are looking to for about 4,000 single vineyards, and all these names can appear on, on Austrian labels. So this makes it necessary, you know, to make a vineyard classification to identify the real icons of Austria. And uh, so whenever you find, uh, whenever you find uh, like these signs, you know, which looks a little bit like a premiere, uh, that is the indication that this vineyard is one of the really icons, one of the very best vineyard sites uh, of Austria.
Now, I'm already coming now to Schloss Globelsburg and, and its history. And, uh, you know, the place here where the, the castle is uh, settled is already, uh, already settled for about three and a half to four thousand years. We have archaeological findings on the spot uh, that are indicating that the place uh, was already settled uh, 4,000 years ago. It was always settled throughout Roman times and the Middle Ages, and the first written documentation comes from the 11th century. We are located here right in the middle of the, of the Danube region, uh, as you can see. And, uh, uh, you know, the castle today is a, is a beautiful Baroque uh, castle uh, coming from the 18th century. So how it looks today, it's coming from about 1740, 1750. And uh, the history of the place is also connected to Cistercian monks. You know, the Cistercian monks came in the 12th century from Burgundy and in the 12th century they were spreading all over Europe. And one of these monasteries was founded just a little bit north of the today's estate. And the monks got the first vineyard in 1171. And uh, so, to the, so with Vintage 2020, we are celebrating the 850th vintage uh, of the estate. Now, as I explained earlier, uh, that uh, still today we are maintaining the, the culture of monasteries in Austria. So the monks have been looking after the vineyards and have been looking after the estate themselves until quite recently, until 1995. And uh, uh, in 1996, I took over the responsibility uh, for the estate together with my wife and my family uh, we took over the estate in a long-term relationship with the monks. Uh, so we believe that this estate is one of the big heritages of Austria. And so this is why we're trying to bring the heritage as good as we can as a family now into the next generation. Now, our vineyards, uh, we are producing uh, and we are... Uh, uh, we are certified sustainable production in, in Austria for our, our vineyards. And we are concentrating mainly on the wines of the Appalachians. So mainly of wines on, on origins. This is the center of our productions. So regional wines, wines of the village, wines of the single vineyards. This is basically, you know, the heart of, of our production on the estate. Besides uh, this, the wines of origin, we are producing a few specialities. So, for example, Langenlois, uh, which is the, the neighboring village, became in the past 20 years the epicenter of, of sparkling uh, production, of quality sparkling production. So we are also producing four different cuvées on the sparkling side. And then... Uh, red wine is also an issue because we have uh, a certain amount of vineyards that, as you can see, are uh, looking a little bit like the Rhone Valley. Uh, you have to imagine that the, the Danube was not always as regulated as today. So in the past millions of years, the Danube was going through different parts of the area. So we find uh, on a certain amount of vineyards structures uh, with these river pebbles, the Galle Roulé, and uh, in these structures, we do not like at all to produce white wines. So in these vineyards, we are focusing then on the red wines based on Pinot Noir and the Pinot Noir family like Solero and the very famous Zweigel grape variety of Austria, which is today uh, the widest planted red wine grape variety of Austria. And then we're producing a series of sweet wines like Auslesen, Bernauslesen, Trockenbernauslesen, and also on a regular basis, ice wine. A special hobby of mine is historical winemaking. So this is something that I started already like 20 years ago. Uh, and I am looking here after a project that is related to early 19th century winemaking. So a period that is reflecting on the empirical knowledge of 2000 years of winemaking on one side. On the other side, to a winemaking that is not influenced by the outcomes of industrialization. And so I think we have a certain responsibility 
to not completely forget uh, about these techniques, these philosophies of winemaking. In principle, uh, we are focusing on, on the production of authentic wines. Uh, the ambition is to produce wines uh, with a strong character of the region. Uh, with a strong focus on, on its soils, on its climate, uh, and uh, on, on the traditional expression uh, of the Danube region, uh, which in my eyes can offer some of the greatest white wines in, in the world. And uh, this is something that was already often proven also by Chances Robinson and other experts. Now, Anna, um, this is now, uh, uh, I think uh, this was uh, a, a very brief introduction now to Austrian wine in general and also to the estate. And I don't know if you, do you have any, any, any questions in related to them before I start with going then into Reed Lamb and Reed Heiligenstein? Um, no, I think we're good for now. We've had a couple of questions. Lance, uh, for any of you who's, who've not spotted on the chat, Lance, who is Michael's importer, um, Lance Voister MW, is helping out with a few questions as well this evening. Um, we've got some vintage questions, but I think we'll wait for those, if that's all right, because when we talk about the 2020 vintage. Um, but other than that, I think you're ready to go to the next section, Michael. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. And we're going then to, to the specific wines. Now, uh, I would like to introduce you to, to two wines that belong to the icons of Austrian wine. First of all, Ried Heiligenstein. Now you see here a picture of this vineyard, which is definitely, you know, one of the real icons of Austrian wine. And uh, it's a vineyard that was probably the first vineyard that was really sold after its vineyard name in Austria. Uh, historically, wine in Austria was mainly sold after village names. So, uh, you know, we were differentiating between names of like Gumpertskirchner and Langenläuser and Leubner and Kremser and so on. So, uh, you know, the very famous villages of wine production in Austria. But only a very limited amount of vineyards, you know, were taken as names for, for wines. And Ried Heiligenstein uh, is one of them. The name Heiligenstein would translate to English as the Rock of the Saints. And the origin of this name uh, is, uh, uh, is related to really ancient times. Uh, because the, the, the original name of this, of this site was Hellenstein. And Hellenstein is indicating a place that was used for hunting. Normally, you know, where you have an area where you are hunting and then you have a sharp edge uh, where you are chasing animals so that they would fall down uh, and where it would be easy actually, you know, to hunt these animals down. And obviously in, in very ancient times, uh, this place was used actually for this, this kind of, of hunts. Now, but some, at some stage it, it translated then from Hellenstein to Heiligenstein and Father Bertrand, who you know, for a long time was the head of the estate here, uh, explained to me that Heiligenstein is originating in a um, uh, in, uh, in a in a donation in, in Krems the donation to all saints. And this is why the name is translating into the rock of all saints. Now, uh, the very special thing about this site is its geology. Now, uh, in contrary to most of the Riesling terraces of the area, where you would find primary rock that is originating in the so-called Varesian mountains, the Varesian Mountains were a mountain site about 800 million years ago with peaks up to 8,000 meters like today's Himalaya. 
uh, and the only remaining part that we find today is the only the, the lowest part of this mountainside, the stems basically. And uh, and now Heiligenstein is a geological island within this formation, and it's a crystalline structure that was mixed up with volcanic material. So here you find uh, volcanic material uh, in the soil. And this is also one of the very specific uh, elements uh, of this site. Now, uh, the other vineyard uh, that I would like to introduce you to is Reed Lem. And Reed Lem is also related to Reed Heiligenstein because Reed Lem is basically the outrunning hill of Heiligenstein. Now here it comes again, uh, the separation between the grape varieties. So when you're looking to the hill, then you see, you clearly see you have the horizontal terraces on Heiligenstein on one side, where it's very dry, high mineralization, and where you would find where you find uh, the expression of Riesling. In the moment where the hill is starting to run out and where the, the land is getting flatter where you have deeper soil, good water supply to the wines, uh, then you're coming automatically uh, to soil that is ideal for Grüner Veltliner. So Riedlem is a vineyard that is represented by Grüner Veltliner grape variety. So uh, maybe a few sentences on the vintage 2020, which is marking the 850th vintage uh, of the estate. Now, here's a few numbers actually on, on the vintage. As you can see, uh, we were starting the year, you know, with very dry. And uh, in general, it can be said, the vintage was a very cool and rainy vintage. Uh, you know, we had, uh, uh, and total precipitation of 710 liters in, in 2020. This is quite high. You have to imagine that we are, uh, we are continental climate with the effect that we are looking to an average pre precipitation in Austria or in, in, in the Danube region of about 400 to 450 liters. For example, 2019, we had an, we had a total precipitation of 460 liters. So 2020 was a really rainy vintage. You know, it really started to rain in May and we were getting more and more uh, rainfall with a peak in July of 200 liters. When it comes to temperatures, uh, it's also uh, quite interesting to compare 19 to 20 that the peak in 2019 was in June with an average temperature of 23.3 degrees Whereas in 2020, the hottest uh, month was August with, uh, um, with an average of 20.5. So three degrees lower than in 2019. So overall, uh, we can say that 2020 was quite a cool and, and rainy vintage. However, um, however, when it comes to harvest time, I can say that you know we are harvesting quite late, and uh, and normally we are starting our harvest at the end of September to the beginning of October, and normally we are harvesting in uh, at least until to November. Sometimes in cooler years even to the end of November. So here I took a few pictures. These pictures were taken in November, and uh, you can see. Uh, it was a pittoresque situation, you know, wonderful colors, uh, a wonderful time, actually. Whenever you come to Austria, uh, don't hesitate, you know, to come October and November. You will find fantastic uh, landscape and fantastic time, you know, to, to visit the growing areas. Um, this is actually the tower on Heiligenstein, uh, which was built already in the 19th century, marking the importance of this vineyard site. Now, uh, when it comes to, to the harvest, as you can see, we are harvesting, you know, in these kind of small boxes. 
uh, comparing to uh, the harvest in 1931, you know, where they were harvesting, you know, in these uh, small box containers they were carrying on the back. But today, you know, we are harvesting in these uh, small containers uh, with different colors, which allows us already to make a first selection in the vineyards. And then all these boxes are coming then into the cellar, they're emptied uh, on a sorting belt where we can do a second selection then on the sorting table uh, before they go then in, into the presses uh, and, to, uh, and then after the, the presses then into the fermentation casks. Um, casks are made from local trees, you know, we um, I already mentioned, you know, that the ambition is to make authentic wines, wines that are representing the expression of our area. Uh, the monks have always been sourcing trees from our area uh, to produce uh, these casks. And if you look into old Cooper books, you will see that uh, the, these Austrian areas, the Danube area, the, the Mannhardsberg area, and the Vienna forest had a very high reputation, actually, you know, in, in oak trees. And uh, so this is a tradition that we are still keeping. And so this is why we still maintain actually, you know, this tradition to use the local trees actually for our casks. Important uh, to know uh, is that uh, uh, Austrian wine is very much related to food. Uh, and this is very important when it comes to Austrian wine. Austrian wine was always meant to be food companion. Our culture in eating and drinking uh, has, has always been a combination of food and wine. And this is why we as winemakers were always forced to produce wines that are good in food companion. Now, uh, this is the reason, for example, why Riesling in Austria is always dry Riesling. This is a big difference, for example, to Germany. And this is also one of the big differences in the culture of eating and drinking from Germany to Austria. You know, we are sharing the same language, but we have a, a huge difference uh, in our culture of eating and drinking in the same way where, as we have a different humor, we have also deep drinking uh, habits. And uh, so this is why there's almost an, a guarantee that when you find Austrian Riesling, it is meant to be a good food companion. Now, Austrian uh, white wine are wines with a nice uh, aromatic flavor, but they're never overpowering aromatic. You know, if you want to have a good food companion, you, then you need wines uh, that uh, are not overpowering food, but are more, you know, companions to the food. And this is what Austrian wine and Austrian white wine is all about. Austrian wine is also good uh, to keep. Uh, you don't have to be afraid, you know, that you have to drink these wines as fast as possible. Uh, we have a library uh, uh, for about 15,000 bottles in our library uh, going back to the 40s. Unfortunately, we were Russian occupation zone, uh, so uh, all, all, all the stocks, you know, were emptied during uh, these periods. But uh, we have a good track, actually, you know, on, on the ageability of these wines. And you would be astonished, you know, how well they keep, even after 50 or 60 years. Um, and I think I am pretty good, actually, in keeping the time frame, aren't I? Yeah. You're so, absolutely fantastic. Absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's so I think that uh, I, I, I think that we, you know, we could uh, go already, you know, in answering questions. Absolutely. Um, I was going to make it uh, just a bit clearer, um, just to members the the, the two uh, vineyard sites that Michael spoke about specifically are the two wines in the Ompromare offer. Correct, Michael. So we have the the Riesling and the Gruner. So we've spoken specifically um, about those, although obviously Michael does make lots of other wines as well. Mm. Um, I will actually start with asking a question from Robin. Um, Robin said that in 2009, he went to a conference in the Austrian city of Innsbruck. 
And whilst there, he was bowled over by the quality of the Pinot Noir he had in a number of delightful wine bars. How is it that, relatively, Austria has been keeping its wine a secret <laughs> for the most part of the world? Is it a matter of limited quantity to export, or are you keeping it for yourselves, or is there some other reason? Well, um, uh, I think it was chances who, who, who were, you know, quoting that uh, Austrian wine is still one of the best kept secrets in the world of wine, uh, and uh, uh, even though that we are we are we are trying to do our best, you know, to uh, to, to to spread the world uh, to spread the world about uh, Austrian wine. Um, how, however, uh, how, however, uh, Austria is is you know is is family business. You know, the, the biggest part of, of Austrian producers are family businesses, and uh, and one of the, the the big disadvantages in family businesses is that. The owner ma mainly still is sitting on his tractor, and uh, the time you know to to come to the UK and, and spread the world is very limited. And um, so uh, we are you know very delighted you know if uh, wine society and others are uh, are doing uh, Zoom sessions you know like this uh, you know to 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 spread the world. To, to spread the word a bit a bit more about Austrian wine, and uh, and is 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 offering you know this 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 delicious wine. Um, red wine is is also something you know that is is getting more and more known in in the world of wine. I already explained that due to the fact that two thirds of Austrian production uh, is white wine production. Uh, the the overall image of Austrian wine is still related to you know to to white wines, um, mainly you know based on on uh, on on Grünwaldina and and Riesling. Uh, however, we uh, you find some fantastic uh, red wines on based on on the Pinot varietals. Um, not only Pinot Noir, but for example, like Saint Laurent, which is a direct relative of. Of Pinot Noir and Zweigel, uh, which is in meanwhile the widest planted uh, red wine grape variety of Austria, and and I'm, I'm always thinking uh, if uh, Zweigel somehow maybe at some stage you know will get about the same image uh, you know maybe as a representative of Austrian wine like Grunewaldina is doing on on the white wine side. Yes, so, but that's, uh, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. And actually, as you mentioned, Zweigelt, um, I've noticed Lance has popped an answer in here, but we have had an anonymous attendee has written, how good can Zweigelt get? Um, he or she has tried the 2010 and the 2011, which were great. Um, now, will the Wine Society stock these is the next question. Um, I interviewed Freddie as to whether there was going to be any more of Michael's wine stocked. He said, not in the immediate future. We're really short on warehouse space, but that certainly doesn't mean that they won't be. Um, so, Michael, perhaps you could just have a, a, a minute or two to just talk about Zweigelt, perhaps introduce it to people who might not know what it is, but also um, what makes your Zweigelt special. Well, uh, the, the special thing about Zweigelt is that um, it's, uh, it's versatility actually in styles um, because the fantastic thing about Zweigel is to, you can produce some, some, some really fantastic light and, and easy drinking uh, um, uh, uh, in introductory uh, wines or basic wines. On the other side, if you if you have good vineyards and uh, and also old wines uh, in very good sites, you can produce some fantastic reserve wines. And um, uh, it it um, I can for those who are interested, uh, we we are we are offering a 2010 reserve Zweigel, for example, um, that it, that is just brilliant uh, and such a harmony and and. Um, so that, that I think that in, on, on, the, on the long run, I think that uh, it's a little bit with uh, the same way as with Bruno Bettina. You know, you, you can make fantastic entry wines, 
And then if you have really good sites, you can some make some of the greatest white wines you know, with this great variety. And I see Zweigel a little bit, you know, in, in that in, in that game and in that range. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, now we have been able to, I believe, unmute a member. So we've had a few members ask a similar question, but I believe, Tom, that you have been unmuted to ask. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? You certainly can. Good. Uh, yeah, my question was on really on the 2019 vintage. I bought both the Riesling and the Gruner Veltliner uh, EP last year, and they're currently sitting in reserves in uh, Stevenage. But my question is, on the 2020 notes that we got through to support this EP, uh, the drink window suggested to drink up within the first, fir first couple of years or leave till six or seven years. Would that be exactly the same for the 2019 vintage? And do you think that the wine just goes through a bit of a dumb phase after four or five years or not? Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, on, on this question. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, I'm, very often uh, we are asked actually uh, about uh, the ageability and the aging uh, and, and the developments of, of these wines. Well, to, to my experience, uh, it's, uh, and this is what I always recommend, is to enjoy these wines either in their youth. So within the first uh, two to three years, uh, and then uh, they're going through what we call the puberty. Um, so it's a it's a period where you better do not touch them, uh, and and then you can start uh, to you know to you know to 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 have a second look at them after six to eight years, about depending a little bit on on, on the vintage, and. Um, uh, and uh, so 2019 uh, is, is, a, is a vintage that uh, probably, prob probably will be fantastic within the first three years. And then you can start to enjoy them after like six, seven years. Uh, 2020, I would, uh, I, I would presume that this is a vintage that will take a little bit longer than the 2019 vintage. Um, so I'd rather uh, would presume that you for, for the second, uh, for the maturity level, uh, I would start after like eight to 10 years to, to start again to enjoy this, this vintage. Uh, 2019, uh, 2020 uh, will be, is as I try to explain, is, is, is a cooler vintage. And in general, the cooler vintage take a little bit longer, you know, until they start to open up again after, after, after the puberty phase. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I think that answered the question perfectly. It does leave me with a challenge as to whether to bring, I've just ordered a um, case of your wines myself, Michael, and it does leave me with the challenge of bringing it out of reserves now or waiting and seeing, seeing what will happen in eight or so years. Um, perhaps you might be able to explain what to expect at that time. So how will the wines have developed? So what, uh, you know, the freshness, perhaps that's changed, developed, things like that. Is there any way you might be able to explain what the wine looks like now and for the next couple of years and then what it looks like later on? Well, um, in, it's, you know, I mean, uh, in, 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 the first, in the first three years, you know, wines are, are somehow still marked, you know, by the, by, by the beauty of you. You know, and so uh, it's a it's a it's a very floral and and uh, primary uh, aromas that uh, are, are are definitely dominating the, the style of the wine. Um, in after six to eight years, um, uh, the, the 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 primary youth is gone. We're, we're coming to maturity. Uh, here we're looking to more harmony. Uh, within all elements uh, of the wine. Uh, Austrian and especially wines from the Danube region are wines that are, are carried by acidity, by liveliness and by easy drinking. I think that uh, when you're looking to the greatest white wines in the world, I think you, uh, 
you you will always find you know that these are wines with substance on one side, but on the other side they always carrying you know this easy drinking character. You know, um, why these wines are profound on one side, but they're always easy to drink. In the same way as as a Meursault or you know the, the best uh, uh, Meursauts or, or, or Morachés are are not uh, you know bulls you know that you know they're they're going through they they are always you know easy to drink wines and this is something you know that you that you will always find you know with the wines in the in the Danube region that you have profoundness on one side but on the other side you know the, the easy drinking character the factor you know that uh, that you it is asking you know to have another sip and another sip you know that really goes easy down the hatch. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, so we have a question. Sorry, pardon me. From Dominic. Now, Dominic, I believe you asked in the chat. I'm not sure whether you've been unmuted, so I'm going to ask on your behalf if that's all right. Um, could Michael explain again what the what the climate is or the preferred climate or terroir that Riesling likes versus the Grüner Veltliner. Just to clarify that, please. Okay, um, I, I did not say too much about climate in, in the Danube region. Um, so may, maybe just a, a few sentences on, on that. Well, you have to imagine that I explained that the Danube region and its appellations are always valley situations. Now, when it comes to the climatical situation, you have to imagine that when, you, when, when you're going up a valley, you always gain in altitude. And the more you gain in altitude, the cooler it gets. Until it's getting that cold that you're reaching the end of the winemaking zone. So the effect is that in all of these Danube appellations, we're always working up to the limit of winemaking. And no matter if it's in the Wachau area or if it's in the Kremstal area or in the Kampen area, these are all valleys where we're always working up to the limit. So we have quite significant differences between the lower parts of the valley and the upper parts of the valley. So basically um, it is not so much uh, a question about uh, Grunewald, Lina, or Riesling when it comes to the climatical situation. It is rather uh, a question of soil that is differentiating uh, the two grape varieties because, uh, because the needs of these two grape varieties are contradictory. That means that you know, what one likes, the other doesn't like, and the, uh, and the other way, way around, you know, as, as I explained earlier. And so the question of Grunewaldina and Riesling is rather, you know, how good is the water supply? Uh, do you have uh, loess or clay in the, in the soil? Or is the vineyard dominated by, by crystalline rock um, uh, for water supply? And, and all these questions, you know, are much more significant uh, to, uh, to the question of grape varieties. What is important in the climatical situation of what is a Kamtal wine? For example, if we're doing a regional expression, uh, you know, in the wines of origin, then we're using grapes from the lower parts of the valley as well as grapes from the upper part of the valley. Because if we want to find the typical expression of a valley wine, of a wine, you know, from the whole region, then it is necessary to take all aspects in account. The grapes from the lower parts of the valley brings us the maturity, whereas the grapes from the upper part of the valley brings us the freshness, the easiness, the, the acidity, the drinking, the easy drinkingness. You know, so uh, and and this is this is basically the functionality that is important when it comes to the climatical situation in these appellations. Fantastic answer. Thank you so much. I'm very sure that will have answered the member's question. So thank you again. Now, uh, we have had a question in from Mark. Mark, I believe that the team are just unmuting you as we speak. So do let me know if you've been able to be unmuted. 
I think I can I think hear so. you, Mark. I'm yes, clicking. I'm clicking the button. Hello. <laughs> Hi. So we visit Austria a couple of times every year, and one of our favourite wines is the uh, Grunewald Eva tradition. And I hadn't appreciated that it's the way in which the wine is made. So I'm just interested to know how that would taste differently to uh, the Reed Lamb that's on offer now. Thank, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, I, I have to consider how, how I explain this uh, because, because the whole topic actually would, would be a whole seminar. Um, and, uh, but maybe, maybe just, uh, just uh, a few sentences. A uh, tradition is, uh, is the wine that, that we do in the context of historical winemaking. So this is uh, a wine that is related to early 19th century winemaking. And um, the, the major differences to what we normally do uh, uh, today uh, is on the craftsmanship side on one side. So uh, the how we how we how the grape processing is is done in in the cellar, um, maceration time, the pressing, um, the sedimentations, uh, fermentation, racking, and the, the the whole the whole process of the maturing of, of the wine is is done differently to what we normally do in in in, in in the typical wines of origin of, of the area. Um, what is interesting is that besides the, the craftsmanship side, uh, is there is also a completely different philosophy that stands behind. Uh, you know, modern winemaking is very much related to a focus on, on, on aromatical questions. Uh, you know, today's winemakers are very concerned about the questions of aromatics. And uh, no matter if it's in our decisions regarding the vineyards or our decisions regarding our, our cellar work, um, the, the, the questions on how aromat uh, aromas are developing and what effect it has on the aromas of the wine, this is very much in the, in the center of our attention. Now, this is one of the big differences to historically winemaking because the general ideas of a, of, a, of a winemaker 200 years ago was related to different ideas. You have to imagine that 200 years ago, wine was something that was rather seen in comparison, in comparison uh, to us as human beings. Uh, it was imagined that wine is something that you know, is, is relatively close to us as human beings. Uh, as we humans have to undergo certain developments until we are grown-ups, also wine has to undergo certain developments until it comes to its maturity. And uh, in the same way as we have to breathe, also wine has to breathe in order to do all these developments. So the principal idea was, you know, to let the wine breathe uh, in order to trigger now the next step of the development process. And this was called the teaching of the wine. So you have to imagine that the relationship between me as a seller master and the wine as my pupil was, you know, rather in, in, in relation uh, or in comparison, you know, to, to, to a school situation. You know, it, my responsibility as a seller master was to identify the potentials of a wine and to teach him right that he would develop up to his potentials, and uh, and this is this is you know a, a completely and you know significant different approach you know in, in the winemaking process, and and this is something that we are we, we are carrying out actually in these tradition wines. Now the effect is that uh, it the effect is that. You're, you're getting on one side to a different aromatical structure and on the other side also to a different structure on the palate. Um, so because, you know, these, these treatments, these, it's, it's a more oxidative treatment uh, and process, uh, which has, a, uh, which has a, a, um, an effect actually on, on the overall structure of these wines. But as I said, this would be another seminar, you know, to go more into details of that. 
But it's thank you fascinating. For the... Yeah, it's a, it was a great question and it really is fascinating um, that look back to tr tradition. And I found it really interesting actually even what you started with talking about this trend towards aromatics. I think often we think of Austrian wine as having this sort of uh, modern Austrian wine as being very aromatic. And actually it's very interesting, Michael, that you're looking back to more traditional styles. So thank you. Um, on that point, and particularly about the oxidative um, aged wines, we did have a member, anonymous, so I apologize for not being able to mention your name, but they are clearly very keen. Uh, apparently you have some single barrel wine of Gruner Veltliner that you've been aging in barrel done from 2009 onwards. And they'd like to know a little bit more about those. Well, uh, this is um, um, <laughs> this is uh, this is also uh, something that is related to historic winemaking. Um, in the in the past, the the thing is that in the past twenty years we uh, we've been producing tradition um, as as an expression of Grunewaldina and Riesling. Uh, so we had two two wines and. Uh, with um, uh, with uh, 2021, so this year, uh, in in the year we're celebrating 850 years, uh, I decided actually to change the the general concept of tradition slightly, um, which means that I started already 10 years ago uh, to put wines in cask aside, and so in the more than 10 years uh, we built up. Uh, a whole collection of reserve wines that I'm uh, planning to release, or I'm starting to release some of these wines uh, this year. And we're going to release these wines in additions. Um, so that means each year we're going to release an, an addition of three wines. And uh, it is planned uh, to do this year uh, a tradition three years, a tradition ten years, and as a kind of a jubilee wine in the context of the of the celebrations, we will be releasing a wine that is uh, that is made from wines of the past fifty years. So that means we. Uh, I asked the abbot if it would be possible, actually, you know, to uh, to to have access to to the old libraries. And we, in the past uh, half year, we have been taking bottles from the reserves. Uh, we've been emptying them uh, into small containers and then we have been blending them uh, more and more uh, until we got the, the, final, the final cuvee. And uh, this, is, uh, this is now uh, a project that is, you know, um, a, a very, uh, a wine that is very, very important actually to us because somehow it's reflecting, you know, uh, the, the history and the traditions of this estate. This is also something, you know, uh, that is really related, you know, to, to our history and to what we have been standing for uh, in the past centuries. And, and, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm actually very proud actually about this, this project. Uh, tradition also is getting getting a new label, um, which is you know very uh, a very very nice project, and uh, hopefully uh, hopefully Freddie will be able actually you know to offer to offer a few bottles actually of this of this QB or at least of the three or, or and, and ten year uh, old uh, old edition wine. He'll certainly have me sending a pestering email. <laughs> to ask him and I think by the looks of things some members as well so um yes well uh, oh and Gil's just said on the chat as well behind the scenes he'll be pestering Freddie too so let's hope that Freddie can buy some of those in and if you if Freddie is unable to do it then we absolutely condone you cheating on us to get those wines because they sound absolutely amazing and, and a really interesting and unique wine so thank you Michael for sharing that um, I, I'm going to squeeze in three more questions. Mm -hmm. Three more, really quick ones. Um, one quick one from uh, Sean, actually, wanted to know, he asked me to ask you, um, what would be your perfect pairing, uh, food pairing with each of the wines? We touched on food earlier, but which would be your favourite pairing? 
uh, honestly, it's um, I think one of the one of the great things uh, about uh, grunewaldina is that grunewaldina is very universal in its use, and um, so it's uh, it's actually it's actually you know hard to say okay this is the perfect match. Um, you have to imagine you know food matching with Austrian wine. Uh, is something that you also can set in the context of the old Austrian Empire. You, you have to imagine uh, Vienna used to be a huge melting pot of very different cultures. Uh, looking to the old Austrian Empire, uh, you have, uh, you have uh, uh, the north of Italy, um, the Balkan areas, uh, you have Hungary, uh, you have the Czech Republic uh, with the dumpling uh, uh, culture. Uh, you have the Alpine areas, uh, you know, everything that is connected to that. So, uh, and everything came together in the end. So, uh, Austrian wine culture is also somehow related, actually, you know, to this, to this, uh, to this culture of eating that, you know, is somehow the essence of continental eating of Europe. And uh, so I, I would not say, you know, this is perfect with Wiederschnitzel or, or something, because, uh, you know, the great thing about Grünwald Lina is that yet uh, there's hardly any mistake that you can do. And this is, this is basically, you know, the reason that Grünwald Lina became, became so fashionably, you know, beyond uh, sommeliers, because imagine, uh, imagine you know, the, the problem of a sommelier. Uh, you know, I, I always say, you know, a sommelier can be either in, in, the, in the fantastic situation that, uh, that he has a set menu where he can make the prefer perfect combination between a, a certain dish and a perfectly matching wine. But in 80% of his life, you know, he's confronted with the situation that he has a table in front of him and everyone's eating something else. So what do you do? You have to compromise. You need wines that somehow go with everything. And this, I think, is the reason that Grunewaldina became the number one grape variety in Austria, because this is exactly the trick that Grunewaldina is playing. You hardly can make a mistake with Grunewaldina. An Austrian sommelier in the situation that, you know, that he has all kinds of different flavors and all, with all kinds of different textures on, his, on the table. And he has to make a recommendation. He will always go for Grunewaldina because he hardly can make a mistake with that. And, and this is also, you know, why also in New York, in London, and, and, and in, in Asia, you know, Grunewaldina, you know, is so hardly welcome because it's, you know, it's completely up to the needs of the sommeliers. And, and this is, I think, this, this, is, this is one, uh, this, this, is, this is, you know, one, one of the things that makes Grunewaldina, you know, so favorably in, in, food, in food matching. I couldn't agree more, Michael. We, all, we actually always have a bottle of Grunewaldina at home for that reason. It's a, a really good crowd wine. And quickly, if I can squeeze in, we have got one more question after this, but just a, a match with the Riesling, if there is one. And if there isn't, that's okay too. Uh, well, uh, it's, it's also a good question, you know, and, and this is, this is why I always say that you know there, there's a significant difference uh, between German Riesling and Austrian Riesling. Um, and as I explained earlier, Austrian Riesling was always meant to be food companion. This is why we try in the vinification not to pronounce you know the aromatical side of this grape variety too much. You know, we would like to have that Riesling has a, a nice and fine aromatical side, but never, you know, too much. Because, you know, if you want, you know, that the wine is, a, is serving as a food companion, then you would like to have a nice and decent fruit flavor, but not too much, you know? And this is, this is why we tend uh, in also in the vinification process to make uh, reasoning and an expression, you know, that, is nice and decent, but not too much an overpowering. Yeah? In Germany, you drink Riesling by itself. You know, in Germany, you drink Riesling either in the afternoon or after dinner. You know, which means that you drink the wines, you know, for themselves. 
This is why, why you can have in Germany more sweetness. And this is why the wines, you know, tend to be more fruity, you know. And, and this is, uh, uh, this is a, a different approach, actually. And this, this is why, you know, I, 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 I can more or less guarantee that for an Austrian Riesling, it will always be dry Riesling and fruit content. Thank you so much, Michael. Right, we have one more question from a member, John Kavanagh. I believe you've been now muted. Fingers crossed. Are you there, John? Ah, I will ask on John's behalf, as it's a lovely question to finish on this evening. Michael, what is your favourite wine and your favourite and vintage? Favorite wine and vintage. Oh, this is a this is a diff, diff, difficult one. Um, and honestly, I, I'm I'm not uh, um, I'm, um, I'm I'm always hesitating actually to ask this question. You know, because uh, within my own wines, you know, to 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 make a favorite uh, beyond another, because I I see my my I, I see my vineyards. You know, as as my children, and in, in the same way as I would not, you know, prefer you know one child to another, uh, I I always I always say you know my my ambition is you know to to be able to show the personality of the vineyards that I'm, I'm producing. Besides, um, beside I'm I uh, beside I really love Madeira. Um, this is uh, one one of my favorite uh, wine region uh, in the world, and beside that also Jerez. Um, the, when it comes, you know, to to traditional winemaking, uh, these are some really great landmarks, you know, in the world of wine. And uh, and so, you know, whenever I have time, I I, I try to do excursions, you know, in, in these areas. So. Yes. <laughs> Great answer. Thank you. I think I, I'm already understanding more about your personality, Michael, this sort of nod to traditional, but also, you know, an overtaking of modern. It's a lovely, lovely combination. Um, mm. So thank you so much for joining us. I can't thank you enough. Um, thank you also to Gil, Catherine and to Lance Voice from MW behind the scenes. Um, we've had plenty of questions. We've managed to get through almost all of them, which is unheard of but you've been an unbelievably competent thorough delightful um gentleman to have on this evening michael so i can't thank you enough i have to be honest a member emailed me who had to dash off and said uh has already expressed how much he enjoyed this evening a very good session quite the best yet um and that he has learnt lots and i think that's one thing i'll take away from as well from this evening not only were you charming and entertaining but i feel like i've learned so so much from you and I have a lot more confidence now as well, buying Austrian wine and a better understanding. So a huge thank you from our team. Thank you members for joining this evening. Um, and we do hope to see you again soon, Michael. Perhaps you'll be able to come over to the UK, but I have no doubt after seeing those gorgeous pictures of November in Austria that we'll have a few members coming over to visit you as well. Thank you so very thanks much, Anna. Again. Thank you. Thank you for everyone to join. Um, for everyone who's coming to Austria, come visit us and uh, enjoy the evening. I drink to that. All the best. Thank you so much, Michael. <laughs> Thank you and good night. Bye.